give Jesus a great hand for all the good things he's doing. We're so excited to be here this morning, and I, I do I want to encourage you to take note of that video we just played. It is absolutely a backbone of what we do is our internship program, raising up many, many young, strong leaders. Uh, the way we're able to multiply campuses is a direct result of how strong our IP program is. We need strong, young men and women who are ready to sell out for Jesus. I had someone call me this week uh, in reference to college, and I thought to myself, and I just off the cuff, and I've probably said this before, there is not a university in this country that I would send my child to right now. The world's in a place of desperate positioning that we need to have our young people on fire for Jesus. If your number one goal is for your child to have an education, you're in trouble. Your number one goal for your children needs to be they know Jesus. And that Jesus knows them, meaning they have a relationship. They don't just know about him, but they do what he does. Can we turn the house lights up, please? We paid the bill. <laughs> turn them all the way up, guys. There you go. We'll save the candlelight for tomorrow when Chris and, and help me, Dawn, are they here this morning? Chris and Dawn getting married at noon tomorrow. So we had uh, Ben and Allison here the first service. They just back from honeymoon and I guess these guys are getting ready to head out. So anybody need to get in line? We need a sign, we need a sign up sheet on the website for marriages, amen. Isn't it exciting that, that, that uh, that Mary just does not go out of style, right? Uh, just like sunsets don't go out of style, they're not old-fashioned. Marriage is not old-fashioned, amen? The only thing that makes a newlywed uh, excited is the fact that one day they can be oldly wed, that we can grow old together. And uh, well, there's more about that later, but, but just uh, know that God is, God is on point with everything he does. He's ne he never goes out of style. It's that we get out of focus. And so today, we, we, our kids get fed a lot of lies. They get, they, you know, I, Pastor Cesar said to me one time when I was in Columbia, he says, you know, the school has your kids five days a week. How do you compete with that? How do, how do you combat the lies that they're spo that's spoken to them? Just, just being there and that negativity of a worldly culture, uh, it, it's important to, to, that they stand out. Your kids should stand out because of Jesus. They learn to be friendly. They learn to be compassionate and and that's a result of who you are. And sometimes it takes a while to, you know, if you stick around long enough. I know with my first round with my children, that was the hard part, raising my kids. Not because of them, but because of me. They changed me to make me the grandfather I am today. I made a lot of mistakes with my children, but I can see the results of not quitting in the grandchildren. I'm walking through the mall yesterday, which was my least favorite thing in the world to ever do. But when I have a little three-year-old granddaughter with bright red hair, just like her grandmother and her, her mommy, Ari was holding my finger, walking through the mall, and she starts pulling away. And I said, what are you doing? I'm trying to make a friend. I said, well, okay, let's go make a friend. And we left the pack of, of 10 or whatever it was that day, and she starts making a friend. And, uh, you know, it's, and the people look at her like, what's going on here? I said, she just wants to make a friend. Oh, okay, that's, that's awesome. And... Uh, but that's what you want to see. You want to see that pureness in the next generation, right? And how do we do that? By hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I'm glad you asked. Come on, how many are blessed today? I want to get right into the word today because I, I got a little long first service and uh, so I've cut some stuff out that I can get on point. I encourage you to go back and listen to the other messages. Uh, we're studying through the Beatitudes and as Pastor Bert said, it may take us two or three years to get through it. We've been our second week on one sentence, and the sentence is this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you hearing me today? I like how the, the Amplified says it. Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous. Somebody say spiritually prosperous. The physical prospering automatically happens when you're spiritually pros uh, prospering. God, God's never going to leave the righteous forsaken ever in your life. And I want to ask you a question today based on what we just read here today. He says you're blessed if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. In other words, you want to be just like daddy. I want to ask you a question. If you were going to see daddy at 3 p.m. today, 
If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that three o'clock today, you're going home to be with Jesus. What would you want to glean from today's message? And what would you want to do about what you received? You see, that's hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Not that we walk around morbid, but you must live in the context of eternity. Eternity is more of a reality than the physical things you're sitting on right now. The fact that Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign forever and the condition of your heart and the decisions you're making today determine where you go. And if you do go to heaven, where are you going to sit? Where are you going to be? Paul says the things we learn in this life are good for this life and the life to come. It's not just about getting across the finish line. It's about fulfilling your purpose that God has planned for you. You say, well, pastor, it's too late for me. I've already wasted too many years. No, that's not true. We're not talking about a natural thing here. We're talking about a supernatural. But not just any supernatural, because the devil's supernatural. He has supernatural gifts. He has ways to make you happy, to make you high, to make you uh, uh, feel good about yourself, feel good about the emptiness in your life. But what God gives you may not be as happy, but it will give you a joy that can be sustained through all eternity. It will take you to a place of strength and comfort. But what are you meditating on? What are you thinking about? When you go into a restaurant, they intentionally give you an, uh, uh, an appetizer menu. Well, there's twofold reasons for that. More money, right? Profit for the business. The tip goes up if, you have a, if you're a person of character. Because, um, you know, if you tip based on what they do, then you probably don't tip too well. But if you tip based on who you are in Christ, then you tip awesome. I don't tip based on how I'm served. I tip based on who, how God has served me. How many, he's given me everything. He's been really good to me. That's why I love to tip, 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 tip. I love to see a sad waitress leave with a smile. Even when they were rude and we were at a place up in Dulles last week and we took a whole gang out to it. There's like 20 of us in this room and they really did not want us there. They were short staffed. They simply said, our service is going to suck today. We, we don't have any help. We're going to blah, blah, blah. We really don't want you to move our tables. I said, we'll move them for you and we'll put them back just like you found them. They're like, my manager's going to get mad. And we're, oh, no, 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 no. This very unhappy person. I said, okay, you're going to be happy today. And we went through the process. They moved the ta- we moved the tables, put them together and blah, blah, blah. The manager and the president, and they went to Congress and finally got it approved for us to move our tables together. <laughs> and I felt like I was in, you know, the state house or something trying to pass a law. And but anyway, I'm, I'm in my restaurant experience wants me to be irritated. So I'm like, dude, your bottom line is hurting right now. I know your, your labor costs are high. I know because you're paying, paying people way more than they deserve. You know, when you know when you, the socialistic mindset, everybody gets paid the same. It, it just makes everything suck. But anyway, because of the joy of the Lord and the peace and the, and, and the, the love that we brought to the room, we made a change in the atmosphere. Why? Because we hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not about how I'm going to be treated. It's not what I'm going to get out. But what can I do for this place today? And I made up my mind we were going to clean that place. We bust all the tables. We stacked everything neatly on the table because they were like gone forever. And the funniest thing is they forgot my meal and it came out way late. And then when it came out, it was wrong. What I do, I smile. I said, I'm going to really be tested with this one. And I'm like, okay. And I'm I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And, and, And anyway... Finally, everything happened. We cleaned the place up. We put the tables back where they were. And then we, you know, pip, tipped about 55, 60% of the check. And those tears kept coming, but they were tears of joy. See, it gave me a right to speak into their life. And it wasn't about the money. It was about the whole thing. They didn't want us there because the girl was distressed. Who knows what she was going through at home? What are you hungry and thirsty for today? To be served? To have your appetite for pizza fulfilled or your appetite for whatever, or are you here on this planet to give? When you stand before Jesus, if it is three o'clock today, what will your attitude be like? What will you, how have you appetized yourself? What do you look at? What do you meditate on day and night? That's how you'll treat people. What you've decided to be, who, what you've decided to be and think, what you dwell on, what you meditate on, has a direct effect on how you treat people. It has a direct effect on your capacity to love God. Because you can only love God to the capacity you can love a hateful person. 
Let me say that again. You can only love God to the capacity in which you'll love the least. Am I helping somebody today? He who hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. filled. The Beatitudes speak of strong inner desire, all of them, all of them we spoke about. A passionate driving force, a pursuit inside of your soul. It speaks about the ambition. Many of us are ambition to get an education, to make a lot of money, to, to be successful in finances. And that in itself is nothing wrong with that. But what do you desire? What do you meditate on? What do you know? Not for self, but a determination to honor God, to obey God, and to glorify God. It's a holy ambition. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be complete. Don't, don't hear the word holy and hear the wrong thing. People use that stupid phrase, you think you're holier than thou. That doesn't even make sense if you break down what it actually means. Oh, you're trying to be more complete than thou. Doesn't everybody want to be complete? Does anybody want to lack in your capacity? You know, if you have two legs and two arms, you want all four of them to work, correct? Nobody wants one eye not to work. Nobody wants one ear not. No, we want to be what? Holy. We want to be complete. And there's only one way for that. And that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have that relationship, you hunger and thirst for him. There's three examples in the Bible that, are, that we talked about last week. I'm going to breeze through a couple of them. And the third one, I'm going to stop them for a second. But the three were Lucifer, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and the rich farmer. And we see that Lucifer was created by God, like everything else. But at some point, he became in love with the creation himself more than the creator. He wanted the creator's position. He wanted the creator's power. He wanted the creator's stuff, but he was done with the creator. That didn't work out so well. Although God gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, after convincing and talking two-thirds of the angels to be on his side, he finally said, enough, you're done. And God's a merciful God. He didn't do that out of hatred, out of anger, but enough. Two-thirds of his creation destroyed by one individual? Listen, don't you think for a moment that the little bit of faith we had yesterday, whatever you had yesterday, is not enough to get you through tomorrow? So today better be a day that you understand that this is the day the Lord has made. This is a circumstance. What are you going through today? This is a circumstance that I recognize that God is God. I will not decide to uh, make myself uh, larger by saying, hey, I can handle this. I will man up and handle it. You can't handle it, but you and God can. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. It's a decision. His ambition was not to reflect God's glory, but to steal it. The moon has no ability to emit light, but isn't it beautiful every night? Oh, that was almost a rhyme. <laughs> it has no ability to do anything but to reflect God. I have no ability in my life to bring any hope to you today. Only if I reflect the truth of the understanding of what I dwell on, what I think on, and what I study upon and what I speak about. Nebuchadnezzar, he was a great ruler and he was, he was fantastic at what he did. But he, he began to lust after the praise of the people, just like Lucifer. He began to, to uh, uh, look for more power and to become more and, and, and uh, identify as the supreme instead of reflecting the light of the supreme. And the rich farmer, again, there's more detail if you go back and listen to the others. The rich, rich, rich farmer, it brings out the fact that he was a fool by putting his trust in what he could do. He put his trust in his happiness he, he put all of, somebody say everything, he put all into making a lot of money, working those extra jobs, running two or three businesses, working himself to death, missing out on what he sh should not be missing out on to gain enough money to sustain himself rather than trusting the Lord. And he was successful with his plan, or was he? Let's read. Luke chapter 12, I'll read from verse 18. So he said, I will do this, I will pull down my barns and build greater there I will store all my crops and my goods. Somebody say, my, my, my. When people speak like that, I, this, my, my, what I did and what I did, you know they're in trouble. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have so many good things laid up for many years. 
The only problem is today he dies. And what did he spend his time doing? Zero for God, 100% planning for the future that he will never see. People, you got to have balance in your life. If you're too busy to serve Jesus, what you're doing is out of order. If you're too busy to win a soul and make a disciple, then you're full of yourself. It's not, that you're, it's not about your personality. It's not about your age. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not about your education. If it was about those things, then Jesus would not have picked the disciples he picked. He would definitely not have picked me. I am the most disqualified in this place and in Bethany this morning. But because of the grace of God, my shy, inward personality is who I really am. God can take it and use it. God can take it and put, but it wasn't my personality at all. It was a holy place. It was being complete, getting rid of the insecurities, getting healed in our heart, and putting our life in order. I remember one of the first mandates Pastor Bert says, you need to work hard that your wife can get up in the morning and do what she wants to do. You got to take that pressure off of the wife. You can't put the pressure on them to sustain the whole house by herself or even doing it together. If you and your wife spend all your time preparing for a future and preparing the business and working yourself to death where you don't have time to do the ministry, your life is completely out of order. Really, how many barns do you need? But God said to him, fool. Turn to your neighbor, don't call him a fool, but say, he said fool. <laughs> fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will, then whose will those things be which you have provided? Well, for what? Many times people, when they, they create a great wealth with no example and pattern of how to live properly, they turn over wealth to the next generation only to destroy them. Rather you leave them a penny and they see the model of the gospel in your life than leave them a million. That's a whole lot better than you're letting on. But it's the truth. The problem is if you don't receive it, it's because your appetite is thinking about the pattern of which you're living. It's okay, all you have to do is change. You don't have to get sad, just change. You, you just change. I remember back when, when I did business, I was in the fast food business. And, and I remember saying, I remember going to our DM and our CEO of the company and say, if we could just have the courage to at least just open up for dinner on Sunday, shrink the schedule on a Sunday, give people some family time to themselves. Because I was in the ministry and I'm like, if I could delete the Sunday, happen to cover that Sunday, you know what they all said to me? That would never work in this industry. I'm thinking. And, uh, you know, just kept, they kept, kept doing things, and, and, and th that was told me no. And then the first double drive through window that, that ever existed happened South Salisbury Burger King. And guess what? Burger King Corp. fined us for doing it. But now it's the standard to the industry. Everybody has double drive through windows. Are you with me? And then we see Chick-fil-A. Don't get hungry because they're closed today. <laughs> they prove the other theory. Seek first the kingdom of God. And not just about Jesus, Jesus going to church. Just the fact that you give your people off on a Sunday to be with their families. Just because you have it set where you don't have to be there. Am I helping somebody? And what, what, what does that look like? Well, it looks like family. It looks like Jesus. And we're so busy tying ourselves down to make a buck. Tying ourselves, for what? How many more dollars do you need? I know it's not speaking to everybody because, you know, I, I could use a few more, right? But, but hear what I'm saying. Hear the heart. What is your appetite for? What margin of success do you depend on? Is it a dollar or is it the salvation of your family? Can you imagine if you could throw Sunday back into your schedule and two nights a week back into your purpose? The only thing Jesus is going to ask you about if three o'clock happens, what did you do about the cross? How has the cross affected your life? And how many people that you say you love have you shared it with? Then he's going to ask you, well, how come they're not here? 
because you didn't tell them. It's just helping somebody. You see, it's, we had to change our thinking. We have to change our appetite. It's your decision. What you think on is what you eat. And I don't have time to tell. I had a really good story. If I have time at the end, I'll tell you. Somebody put the wrong pizza in a different box. If I have time at the end, I'll share it. Or you can go back and listen to 745. So we see that Lucifer hungered for power. Nebuchadnezzar hungered for praise. And the rich fool hungered for pleasure. Because they hungered for the wrong things. And they thirsted for the wrong things. And rejected God's good things. They lost both. It's not that God doesn't want you to have some things. He wants you to have blessing. But you trust in that little teeny shovel somebody talked about earlier. God has a big shovel. Put the shovel down. Trust him. I'm not talking about being lazy. You don't work, you don't deserve to eat. Period. You can't find a job, go out and work tomorrow. All of those jobs available. I got to get focused here. Necessity of spiritual hunger. As hunger and thirst represents the necessities of the physical life, so spiritual hunger, righteousness, and, and the things of God, if we don't hunger for the righteousness, hunger and thirst to become like Jesus, and then when we understand what he was like, be like Jesus, do what he did, then are we spiritually die. We become useless. It's not about even heaven or hell at this point. It's that are you, are you useless? That's why you, you, listen, how many more things can you do for fun to make you feel better? The truth is, no matter how many wives you end up marrying, neither one of them is going to satisfy you. No matter how many children you have, that's not going to satisfy you. Now, even grandchildren, I don't care if you have 50 grandkids, that's not going to bring the thing that you need. That emptiness cannot be filled with, eter or with, with earthly relationships. It can only be filled with a supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ. You must be born again, and then once you're born again, you must grow, grow, grow. You have to go forward in the kingdom. You have to hunger and thirst to be like him, and then all these grandchildren and all these children and your wife and your family and your business can be enjoyed. Without that, it's always a gnawing toothache in the back of your spirit. Never satisfied. Is this helping somebody? Are you hungry? I used to, I, I, I told the grandkids, we had them last week, they're, they're wanting food and, and I don't want that. Well, then you're not hungry. Uh, we're going to have dinner later. Here's some options. Nah, nah. No, you just want a sugar fix. You're not hungry. Right? See, that's, and that's when we come to church sometimes. We're not, we haven't even wet our appetite to hear truth. We come in, we just want something to get us excited. And you know what? This should get you excited. Change your appetite. That's why I started off with the appetizer. What do you do when you stand for Jesus? What do you want to know? What do you want to change? I'm, as I'm in my background thinking, what I preached at 745 and what I'm saying to you now, it's challenged me to the core. There's things I'm thinking about. I was up outside this morning, beautiful sunrise, nice cool breeze blowing, and just, just in the darkness of the early morning, just like Jesus. Get on his time frame, just like Jesus. Whatever he did, however he did it, try it that way. Shift what you're doing, change what you're doing. What? To be like Jesus. To do it how he did it. Find out why he did it. He explains it as we dig into the word. He shows us every person in the world was created with a sense of inter emptiness. Only God can fill. That gaping hole of dissatisfaction. People try to fill it with stuff. We spend a lifetime trying to fill our lives and complete ourselves without God. It is impossible. We must not love the things of the world. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not the Father but the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will. Somebody say does. does. He who takes action does the will of the Father. Whew. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. What does it mean to abide? To live with. To be established with God. 
not just for here and now, but forever. Amen? And David says it like this. Speaking of hunger and thirst, he says, he says in Psalms 119.97, Oh, how I love your law. Everything about God is my obsession. David made a lot of mistakes, but it was his love, his appetite to be with God, his appetite to praise him, his appetite to know him. It was his obsession. It is my meditation all the day. What are you meditating on? The reels? And I, I get it. I'm, I'm looking at myself. I said, why am I looking at this? Why am I just watching these? And I know some of them are so funny. But you can get addicted. The next thing you know, you've got 30 minutes wrapped up in stupid little videos. 30 minutes you cannot get back. It's gone. You can lose a million dollars and get it back in a week. But you'll never get one minute back that you waste. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 7. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. The NLT says it like this. I love God's law with all of my heart. Speaking, the heart speaking of the spirit. The true believer desires to obey even though he struggles with the unredeemed flesh. Listen, this flesh is, is still alive. There's parts of it that you're going to be killing till the day you die. Crucify the man inside. He's the one you're fighting. And all the struggle. Sometimes we spend a lot of time trying to counsel someone when it's really a demon that needs to be cast out. Yeah. At some point, you have to decide this is no longer. It's one thing to be sick. It's one thing to have a habit. It's one thing to have an addiction. But when you nearly lose your life over things over and over and over again, it's time to get out of bed with the enemy. It's time to stop dating Satan. It's time to sp stop spending time with the ide ideology of Lucifer. It's not the one who's patting you on your back and telling you you're okay. It's the one that's poking you. Hey, that's not right. That's the voice you need to listen to. Listen to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and be set free by the power of the blood of Jesus. The meaning of spiritual hunger means to be famished or starved. We've been so fat and satisfied with, with things of life. It's so easy to get high on, on money and on success and all the things we do. And then the drugs and the alcohol, China trying to kill us with the fentanyl, sending it over hoping to kill us. We bounce back from the little germ they sent us. Amen. Covering us with the blood. And now here comes the fentanyl. And, it, and it's not China, it's Satan. It's Lucifer. He just happens to be using them right now and the rest of the world and, and America. The fact that we let them come across the border and give it to our kids. So there's a lot of people we could blame, but the ultimate reason we're in a mess is we bowed to Lucifer. We bowed to the spirit of the age. We, we've diluted the gospel. It's not the strength of the secular humanism that's the problem. It's the weakness of the gospel you preach. It's the weakness of the word that you know. It's the weakness of what you hunger for. You're feeding on the wrong things. And on fight day, we're losing the fights because you're not full of the spirit of the God. You're not full of the, the power of his word, the unadulterated, but the pure word of God and what it tells us to do, not just knowing it, but doing it. It's easy you get in a car with someone who has a, who has a license because they passed the test versus someone who's been driving for a while. You'll lose your last nerve. You get in a car with someone who, who just passed driver's ed. <laughs> You're pushing that brake that doesn't exist. <laughs> right? That's why from a young age, our children should be preaching the gospel. Why aren't they in your household? Because you didn't do it. Now, don't get mad. Change. You're a new parent today? Change now. If you're a grandparent, change now. If you're an in-between, change now. Change and trust the Lord with a supernatural multiplication in these last days that we'll see happen in one year that could, it could have taken 20 to get there. God will multiply your time, especially in these last days. As we see the time approaching, we cannot forsake the assembling of ourselves, not to get together and feel good, but to get together and get prepared for war, preparing our children for the battle they're going to be facing. Satan lying to them about their identity and telling them they're worthless. Satan's providing his tools. What are you providing? Yeah. He'll give it to them for free the first time. Then it costs you everything for a lifetime. Am I helping somebody?
It's time to change. Hallelujah. Are you hungry or are you starving today? I said, are you hungry or are you starving today? Luke 1.53 says, he has filled the hunger with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. What is the objective of spiritual hunger? Number one, for the believer. I mean, for the unbeliever. It's to bring you to salvation. The hunger of who God is. The, the, the attitude Jesus taught. Everyone on first was to bring people to salvation. And then secondly, to sanctification. Let's look at salvation for a minute. Every one of the Beatitudes so far, when you realize that you're poor in spirit, you realize the sin in your life. You realize that you can't do it. It's impossible. How many's tried more than once to fix yourself? You realize it doesn't work. So when we, when we hear this, blessed are the poor in spirit, it's a place of realization, I need Jesus. Blessed are the mourning. Well, what is that? Mourning and sadness, you understand you do not want to be in this condition and you turn from your sin. Blessed are the meek. Well, in meekness, you then submit your own sinful ways, what? To the power of God. You can't handle your sin. You can't destroy your sin. Only God can. In the meekness, he gives you strength. That means you don't become arrogant and boisterous, but you take the strength that God has given you and apply it. And then today we talk about hunger and thirst. You seek God's righteousness. In Christ, to replace and absorb the sin in your life. The DNA of his blood that was shed, he absorbs it. You see, righteousness is all about being saved. Coming to a place of salvation. The opposite of, of being righteous is self-righteous. Saved, unsaved. God's way, my way. Success, failure, life, death choose life however the only way to salvation is by hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness to replace our own self-righteousness with the reality of his righteousness the second function of these beatitudes is for sanctification for the believers those who have already accepted Christ the hunger and thirsting is to grow once a baby's been born, that's, that's happened. The baby's born. But how many realize we don't have a baby to have a baby forever? They're cute for a season. But when someone's been serving Jesus for 30 years and they still suck on their thumb, that's not too cute. Oh, brother, I've been serving the Lord for 30 years. Yeah, but the problem is you're still in year one. Anything that challenges you and challenges the way you think, you say, no, 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 that's not for me. That's not my personality. And you're in direct conflict with God Almighty. Your insecurities and Satan's over here saying, hey, this isn't for you. This isn't for you. And God's saying, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. See, there's rest in the work. The work you're doing is killing you. The work God wants to do is give you life and eternal life. That you can do this thing. You trust the God with that business. You trust the God with that unsaved loved one. By, by doing his way. Am I helping somebody today? The sanctification is for the believer to grow and to become faith and dependence on the word. Do you trust the word? If you trust the word, then you'll do what he says. Growth in, is sanctification. Salvation is instant. Sanctification is a process. And Satan will lie to you. Oh, you can't do this because it's not your personality. That's a lie from hell. It's destructive to you and your children and your children's children. Men, it's time to wake up and lead. Moms and dads, it's time to lead your household of faith. Not, not getting into a bickering fight with politics. And you'll get a, listen, if you preach Jesus, you're going to always be accused of being political. I get hate mail about that all the time. I ignore it. Because I don't care what it is, what form the devil stands in front of my grandson, my granddaughter, my wife, my children. I don't care. You're not going to cancel me because I don't align with your political viewpoint, Antichrist. You see, they don't even know. The reason they don't know is when's the last time you tried to win a politician to Jesus? When have you prayed for them last? 
instead of cursing them and coming against them. Yes, I will stand and speak the truth over every lie that's been told to my children. Every inconsistency from the word, but I will love the person who spoke it. You see, that's where we differ from this hateful back and forth speech in our country right now. We need to get out and do the work. We need everybody. Philippians 1.9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Shoo. Being filled, get this, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. What are you giving birth? What are you conceiving? Are you conceiving fear and I can't? Or are you standing in courage that your little grandson, your little granddaughter can follow Jesus in these lasting evil days? A generation needs us to stand in the gap and to become and to be what God says we can be. And if I die doing it, that's okay. I'd rather my children see me die doing what is right than live to a long ripe age doing it wrong. The battles that you don't conquer, the insecurities and the fears that you don't conquer, the fears of suicide, the result of suicide, the result of death, whatever has damaged your spirit, whatever has pained you deep down in your spirit, let the Holy Spirit heal you today, that you can be and become what God has called you to be, that they will see the fruits of your righteousness. We're not right, but He is. And when we produce the fruits of righteousness, it means we're loving people at any cost. Willing to change, willing to put our lives in order. It becomes obvious then that we cannot possibly have our longing for godliness satisfied in this life. This life has nothing for you. Your wife and your husband in and of itself has nothing for you without God's purpose. The only reason God created marriage was to fulfill his purpose. The byproduct is the fact we get to enjoy it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That doesn't diminish the awesomeness of what we have in a marriage. It doesn't diminish the awesomeness you have in children and grandchildren. But we have to learn from the model. Many of you here today, you've watched parents do it wrong and now doing it right. Stop holding them accountable to the past. Stop looking at where they went wrong and look the fact that they're right today and they have led you to a right place. I understand what it's like to see leaders in your life fail you and leave you with nothing to stand on. But you take what they did right. You take the goodness out of it and learn from it and run with it and take it to the next level. Learn from their mistakes. Psalms 107.9 says, For he satisfies the longing of my soul, and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. In verse 34.10, The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Psalms 23.1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you're wanting something you don't have today, you're not trusting the Lord. Because faith is the evidence of things not seen. If you're walking in faith, it's already done. If you can see it, you can have it. Ask God to restore the vision for your children. Restore the vision for your life. Restore the vision for your future. No matter how broken you are, what you can see and what you can believe in faith, it is so. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Oh my God. Lord, we need you today. Come on, cry out to him. Say, God, I need you today. I got to be like you, Lord. I love your law. I love your principles, God. Teach me, oh Lord, to be like you. Oh, hallelujah. Jeremiah 31, 14 says, I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord God Almighty. That first statement says, fully satisfied. Fully satisfied doesn't mean you don't get hungry again. But when you get hungry, you know what to go back and eat. When you finally taste the goodness of the Lord, He will satisfy you. 
And then when you begin to do the will of the Lord, you become hungry again. You look to the Lord. He will satisfy you. Something goes wrong. Somebody dies. Oh, I'm going to go eat the goodness of the world. He will satisfy me that I can continue to go forth and do what he's called me to do and finish the job he's called me to do in the season that he has allotted for me. I don't know how many days you have left. I don't know how many days I have left, but I want to finish the goodness of the Lord in my life and in your life before I pass this planet. And if it's at 3 o'clock today, I'm going to make some phone calls today. I'm going to call somebody. I'm going to forgive somebody. I'm going to love on somebody today. Today. Today is the day of salvation. John 4, 14 says, But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give them will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will come in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. What does God want to do? He wants to fix your internal plumbing. He wants to divert the dam that that living water will flow through you forever. That hurt, that pain, that divorce, that suicide, that death, that, that broken, that being used, that maybe raped or sexually abused and, and, and it created a dam. God says he wants to blow with the duminous power of the Holy Spirit that dam open, that in your spirit rivers of living water will flow and you will never thirst again. Will you still hurt when you think about it? Yes but you're seeking the name of God. You're eating the appetite of what God says. You're eating of righteousness so you can forgive. You're eating of righteousness so you can go forward. You're eating of his righteousness. I'm thirsty, Lord, today for your righteousness. I'm hungry, Lord, for being right in the eyes of God, not in my ways, not in what I can do, but only what God can do in and through me. How do we know that we're eating the right food? How do we know that we're hungry and thirsty? You become dissatisfied with the way things are. Not as a spoiled brat, but as a knowing there's something more. I thought the day we got married would be the best day of my life ever. Far from it. Today is the best day with that woman. Let me say it again, today is the best day not the day we walked the aisle. That wasn't even love. Because if love can't be tested, it can't be trusted. You know, at the beginning, there's a lot of feelings and emotion involved in that. The test of the love is 10 years down the road. 20, 30. 2023, it'll be 40. I'm here to tell you what God does for one, he'll do for another. I'm not here because I got everything right. I'm here because I'm starving. I've had every type of appetite you could possibly think of. Tasted of every piece of filth the devil has tried to offer. But God has kept us. He has sustained us. And today I hunger and I thirst from righteousness. Are you satisfied with your life? Then you're not hungry. Specifically, I'll, I'll speak to our, our friends in Bethany. I wasn't satisfied with just meeting at Mike's house. I like Mike. I love those meals of the early days. But it wasn't sustainable for the whole town. Can I get an amen from the Stone House? That's a lot of meals. I'm sorry, the McCarthy house. These guys that have names and, and concrete stone businesses got me all confused. I love the fact that we got to meet in the conference room where you're sitting today, but I'm not satisfied. I was happy that Cody and Danielle went down as business people to serve in a capacity to lead and to train what they have been taught here. I loved what Jordan and Michaela, Pastor Jordan and Pastor Michaela did while they were here. It's my baby girl. I love what they did here. But you notice you don't see them so much anymore. Why? They're laying down their life to go do the call. We're building a team in another city just like we have here. Why? Because we're dissatisfied. What are we dissatisfied with? Because there's people in the Bethany Beach area that need Jesus. And there's people that flock there from all over the country that we're going to reach and spread 
3C community character courage all over this USA. You see, just, I'm just hungry for more. It's not dissatisfied as a brat. It's that I know daddy's playing peekaboo with me and he keeps popping his head out from behind Bethany. Oh, we gotta go there. And, and then Talbot County and, 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 and then Prince George's County. And then, are, are you with me? Across this nation. And it's my hope and my desire and my hunger to see our children. That's why we do IP. It's not a broken wing project. Our IP is for men and women who want to do the ministry, who want to fight for the kingdom of God. Are you hungry? Quickly, I got to close this out. So the test is there's a dissatisfaction. No matter how successful you are, you'll say this like Paul did, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, Romans 7, 24. The second thing is you have a sense of freedom. In your hunger, there's a freedom to go do. It's not sentimental about having to have all my children here. We send them. Your kids are next. Are you hearing me? Your kids are going to go. They're going to go and do. The third thing is there's a craving for the word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, my spirit. For I am called by your name. Come on, say that. I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. One of the most tragic days of my life is when my nephew passed. And uh, my brother called and he asked, how do we get through this? In a point of grief. And I had nothing to say. And out of my mouth came the call. The only thing that's going to get this nation through what we're seeing happening right now, and I believe it's, it's wretched what we see happen, but there's a call. Do you hear it ringing? As Jeremiah, he didn't have a cell phone, but he heard the call. What ringtone are you tuned into? When there's something really special you don't want to miss, my oldest granddaughter has a a phone that's not a phone phone, but it's only when she has Wi-Fi, she can send me a message. And I always miss it. And she's so important to me that I get those calls. I went through and I found the weirdest, loudest, most obnoxious ringtone I could find. So when she calls, I'll, oh, that's Haley. And I'll stop what I'm doing and talk to her. Why? Because it's important. I hunger and thirst to be with Haley. She's my first grandchild. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What is precious to you? Is Jesus precious to you? Do you carve out a place where nobody else can come into? It's rough at first. I remember being jealous of my wife because she got this before I did. When she started pulling away to another man away from me. It wasn't just any man. It was our Heavenly Father. And she created an appetite in our household. This is back when the kids were still at home. I would get jealous in my sick mindset. I already went to church. Let's have some you and me time. No, I need to get with the Father. And I would get angry. Is it okay that I'm vulnerable with you? Because I'm probably not the only one that feels that way. We do enough church. It's not about doing church. It's about being the Bible. Being with the Father the craving of the word. Fourth thing is it's a pleasantness about you. The pleasant things of God, the atmosphere that God wants to change. God will chasten you. He will, he, will, he will rebuke you, but suddenly you don't get angry anymore when being rebuked. That's a change. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. The fifth thing is the fifth mark of someone with the right attitude, you're not an unconditional, you're, you're an unconditionally submissive person. In other words, when God tells you to do something, the first thing out of your mouth, well, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. God, if you'll save my son, then I'll go do that. No, go do that and he'll save your son. Your son is a part of your promise. Am I helping somebody? Stop being conditional with God. God, if, you, if you'll do this, then I'll know you're God. Well, that's no good. There's no faith in that. 
without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let's stand to our feet. Here in house and in Bethany and those watching, just stand to your feet for a moment. Today, this word is for the believer and the unbeliever. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is your opportunity to receive him. And I want us, if we would, to go to Psalms 51. As a believer, as David was when he prayed this prayer, you can pray it today too. As an unbeliever, you can in faith pray this and prepare your heart to be born again today. Psalms 51, starting with verse 1, it says, and I want you to repeat after me, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. That guilt. Come on, say it, the guilt. Satan loves to take the guilt and twist it into your womb. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to remove the guilt. Say it. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. It haunts me day and night against you. And you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth. Honesty from inside me. In the inward parts. In the hidden part. You will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. Purify me from my sins. And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Daddy, don't look at my sins. And blot out my iniquities. Come on with passion. Say, create in me a clean heart. Oh, God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me in your generous spirit. Then I will teach. Then I will teach. Then I will teach. Then I will teach. It's not about your personality. Have you received the goodness of God today? Do you believe what you prayed? Then go teach somebody. How did you get to this place today? If you prayed that, how did you get there? It wasn't your personality. It wasn't your abilities. It wasn't your capacity. It was the mercy of a living God. Can we give him a great praise?